I would like to talk about Hebrews 13. The writer um, is still in question who it is. In many ways it resembles Paul, but it's not him. It's not Paul. But this writer is, uh, after giving all of these instructions and illustrations, he's so... But by the way, some people think it's Barnabas. But be that as it may, it cannot be definitively proved that it isn't Paul or that it is or that it's any other particular writer. But be that as it may, now what's happening in chapter 13 is this um, series of summations and he's going to encapsulate in some real clear directives some things that he wants these or this audience, these readers or perhaps hearers, the letter will be written to a church and a group of people and somebody would read it probably rather than passing it around to every individual it was more than likely read in a congregational setting much as I often read the Bible to you. Now the, the upside is, is you have your own copy. In that case they would be hearing. But it's a call for personal kindness to the brothers and sisters in the church and to strangers and to prisoners so it matters how we treat people. So here's how what he says in verse 1 of chapter 13. Let brotherly love continue. He's assuming that there is brotherly love. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them. Those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Now, brotherly love is not the kind of love you have in a family where you scrap and fight with your siblings. You ever have those? Anybody here uh, two years or less apart from a sibling? Okay. Are you close? Still close? You ever scrap and fight as kids? A little bit. Who's the aggressor, the other one? Oh, of course, yeah, she's not here to defend herself, so it had to be her, yeah, duh. <laughs> How many are here then, uh, you've got a, your closest sibling is more than two years from you? Are you close? It doesn't matter, just distance. Are you close? How about when you were younger? Any scrapping, fussing? Human condition, isn't it? So many families have poor role models for children to emulate. Let brotherly love continue. I'm not saying necessarily that Bible times families were better, but there was a more cohesive family unit. There was a certain respect and honor for those older than you. There was a respect for elders, and anybody older than you was elder. I've always been amused by the little boys in brown suits on bicycles. You know, 19, 20, elder. <laughs> okay. All righty. Entertain angels sometimes. Everybody's heard or got a story about a hitchhiker, right? Do you know those stories? Anybody? Who? You've heard a story about a hitchhiker who was an angel? Ken? That, you, tell me. That were engaged in rides, and he was given a ride, I believe, and during the process of riding, the moon comes up. The dad comes up, and he supplies that man with the um, disclaimer that that person in the seat had left to go and let him know. And then what happens to the hitchhiker. Dina, what's your version? You're going to make it up as we go? Huh? <laughs> the, the story I heard, guy picks up a hitchhiker, uh, witnesses to him about Jesus, he gets saved, they pray, he blinks, the guy's out of the car, he's gone. Angel. Or some variation of the pick up the hitchhiker, something miraculous occurs, 
the hitchhiker's gone, it was an angel. Lots of stories abound. where they, They're not verifiable. But here's the point I want to make to you. We don't worship angels. We don't get excited about angels. In the Bible, whenever an angel was present, people acted like it was an angel. They recognized it was an angel. Now, the story in Genesis 18 of Abraham, when the Lord, it says three visitors came. But the Lord spoke, and it's L-O-R-D, all capitals. It is believed to be a theophany. It's an Old Testament appearance of Jesus pre-incarnation. Incarnation means birth in the womb of Mary. That's the incarnation of Jesus, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Pre that, there are many Old Testament appearances, theophanies. That whole thing is not, so when the three show up, Abraham runs to meet them, offers them food, brings them into his tent, runs and has a servant, run and kill a fatted calf, has to run and make bread, so they serve him a meal, and these three strangers come in and sit down and have a meal with Abraham. This is not an instruction on entertainment, how to entertain strangers. This is an instruction in Genesis 18. The lesson we are to learn is that God may show up in some kind of unexpected fashion and you should have kindness, generosity, deference. Deference is a word you hardly ever hear. When you defer to someone else, you give them the privileged position. If you're on a bus and a woman gets on and you stand up and give her your seat, you are deferring to her. Deference. Uh, it's hard to show deference to someone above you in a food chain unless you can distinguish and differentiate between position and personality. Sometimes the people above you, they're not good persons. But because of the position in the food chain, you can defer and show preferential, um, I don't mean to repeat, I was going to say preferential deferment, but preferential treatment to somebody above you, you're recognizing the position without regard to the personality. So how can you be a submitted child of God walking in submission to authority unless you know how to defer? Most of us are selfish. Or perhaps we're shellfish, I'm not sure. But we are selfish. And because of that, we tend to... Um, preserve our own self-interest first. If I am crucified with Christ, then the life I live is by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me, and I'm, I'm not interested in my own position. Um, we're going to get to some scriptures that will deal with that, but I just wanted to emphasize that God desires a personal relationship with you. God came down himself to tell Abraham, the promise I made all those years ago is about to be fulfilled. The time is at hand. And God showed up to tell Abraham, let's have a meal. Let's commune together. It's a personal relationship thing. So it matters how you treat people because God wants to be represented well. So showing kindness is a good idea. God is into personal relationships. Hebrews 13, 3, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, though those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. It's the golden rule. Treat others the way you'd like to be treated. Somebody said, boy, if I had a million dollars, I would... I suspect that generosity is an attitude that's not related to how much you have. Somebody who can't tithe on a hundred dollars probably isn't going to tithe on a million. Just saying. Generosity is an attitude. And then 
the, the writer here is stressing another relational issue, and that's marriage. These Hebrews are living amongst a culture that marriage is a um, option, kind of like the culture we're in today. Marriage is optional, and, and monogamy or sticking to one partner, well, that's also optional. Matter of fact, there's lots of benefits in I was raised, my parents called it catting around. You ever heard that phrase? They must have had cats. <laughs> Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Fornication, adultery, same act, before marriage, after marriage. You tracking? Same act. Sexual intimacy outside of marriage or sexual intimacy with someone other than your marriage partner. Same act. God will judge. Well, when's God going to judge? Not when you think. And never soon enough. Somebody said if God doesn't move pretty quickly, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah the blatant, open depravity, perverseness in the culture is uh, almost beyond description. There are some who say clergy shouldn't marry. This Bible says marriage is honorable among all, everybody. It's honorable. It's honorable to be married. It's honorable to stay married. It's honorable to honor the marriage vow. It's honorable to do that. So it's a call for sexual purity. Hold marriage in high regard. Applies to everybody. One man, one woman. That's marriage. That's the definition of marriage. We live in a culture now where the... I want to be a little careful how I say this... Um, Language has been co-opted by, I believe, the forces of hell to make words no longer mean what they used to, and they've poured a different meaning into those words. The most primary example, of course, is the word gay. Used to mean happy. Not so much. Used to be a store, I think it was nationwide, it was called the Gay Blade. Remember that store? The Gay Blade, a men's clothing store. So you can see that didn't last. And then the next injunction is avoid monetary greed, be content with what you have. You have the Lord, and that's enough. So here's the verses. Verse 5, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Well, that's confidence in an unseen God that you can't prove other than your changed life is proof. I want to read that same verse in the contemporary English version. Don't fall in love with money. Be satisfied with what you have. The Lord has promised that he will not leave us or desert us. And this promise, like all the others, is to those who fully trust in God with their whole heart. Joshua 1.5. I'm just going to read a few scriptures here. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. First Chronicles 28.20. David is speaking to his son Solomon. 
be strong and of good courage and do it. And the do it refers to build the tabernacle, build the things that the tabernacle needs, make the instruments, build the structure, get it done. I had this vision. I wanted to do it, but I have blood on my hands. God will not let me build it. You, God has favored, do the work. Do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. Everything that's going to be needed for the congregation to worship God, you get to make that. You get to build that. You get to construct that. So there are four negatives here to emphasize the absolute emphatic affirmative. God will not leave you, will not forsake you, all those will nots. That's the emphatic affirmative. God will be with you. Luke 12, 15 from the New Living Translation, second edition. Then he said, beware, is Jesus speaking? Guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. No matter how many model trains you have, Paul, Not enough trains and not a big enough house to run all the track. You need to co-opt the uh, Museum of Natural Science and Industry down in Chicago and bring that whole thing and put it in your house. If you've never seen that train display, you haven't lived. If you ever go to Chicago, you need to go downtown to the Natural Museum of Science and Industry. Right up on the, on the lake, isn't it? Off the loop there. You can almost throw a rock, and if you have a really good arm, and hit Lake Michigan. Every kind of greed. Can anyone define greed? Wanting more. Never enough. I believe it was J. Paul Getty in the early 1900s, very filthy rich. I don't know if he was filthy, but he was rich. Or perhaps it was Rockefeller. I don't remember which one. Being old and forgetful, it's hard to tell. Anyway, one of these rich guys, you know, one of, one of Wilbur's relatives, they said, how much more money do you need? And he said, just a little bit more. When you have power, you want more power. When you have money, you want more money. You want your money to make more money. If somebody gave you a million dollars, wouldn't you try to figure out a way to make the million become two million? Liar. You'd go to the Table Mountain, see if you could uh, <laughs> or you'd do something. Invest in real estate. Uh, you, you, you'd try to find a way to make that money do more than just, because you, otherwise you'd consume it all up. So that's why the scripture said life is not measured by the stuff you have. Philippians 4.11, the New Century Version. I'm not telling you this because I need anything. I have learned, I love this phrasing, I have learned to be satisfied with the things I have and with everything that happens. You know, if you could just do that, this would be the only sermon I'd ever need to preach the rest of my life. If we could learn that. Satisfied with the things I have and with everything that happens. Man, I don't know how you can be satisfied when, when you have tragedy. But the Bible says the just will live by faith. But we being supposedly rational and sane humans, we want answers. We want to figure out why did this occur? Why did this happen? And kind of it's a, it's a thing that says, well, maybe I could avoid that. Maybe this doesn't need to happen to anybody else. Uh, God is never caught by surprise. God has taken into account the mistakes others will make regarding you. He's taken into account your mistakes. He's taken into account all the things that you will fail at. He's already calculated that in. The Bible says clearly that our days are numbered in his book. When you are conceived, your DNA is set in motion, and those things are a given. God is never caught off guard by any decision you make, any change of mind, any reversal 
of the change of mind. All of those things are already considered by God who is omniscient, knows everything. That's just almost too difficult to get your brain around that. Because we have free will, and yet God is aware and knows. Satisfied with everything I have and with everything that happens. To, be, to choose to be content with that. Doesn't mean you have to be happy about it, but you can be happy and contented in it. Because God is never caught by surprise. 1 Timothy 6. Serving God does make us very rich if we are satisfied with what we have. We brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out. But if we have food and clothes, we'll be satisfied with that. Those who want to become rich bring temptation to themselves and are caught in a trap. They want many foolish and harmful things that ruin and destroy people. So I started this by saying, avoid monetary greed. Be content with what you have. You have the Lord and that's enough. And then religious directions follow the moral directions that we've just gone through. And I'm only going to do a couple of verses here. I'm going to pick it up at verse 9 next week. But uh, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I believe what the writer is saying, your past leaders may have passed on, they, they may have died, they may have passed away, but we have Jesus who never changes. Consider the outcome of their life, imitate them and follow him. So there are many spiritual leaders through our lifetime, Billy Graham being the most recent who was large on the world stage. We can imitate him, but follow Jesus, amen? Rely on him. Father, would you bless your word to our lives today? You allow us to touch many people, some believers, some non-believers. Lord, help us to be aware that when we are kind, we are displaying the characteristics of you. Who in loving kindness and mercy sought us, bought us with your own blood, redeemed us, bought us back, Claimed us as your own. Adopted us. It's, it's incredible. So Lord, may we have a right and biblical understanding that we can conduct ourselves in a way that is honorable to you. That some life may be impacted and you will receive glory. Thank you, Lord, for helping us see better do better and represent you better. For this we praise you and thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.